I'm going to introduce our next speaker uh, from, uh, from here. Uh, and she is uh, Joanna Lair, who is an associate researcher at the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales uh, in Paris and a member of the Centre d'Études Sociologiques et Politiques Raymond Daron. She's the author of at least two books, at least two books that I know of, and there may be, may be many more. Uh, la Torah dans la Cité, l'émergence d'un nouveau judaïsme religieux après la Seconde Guerre mondiale. It's the title, uh, it's, it's the Torah in the public, uh, in this public sphere, the emergence of a new Judaism, religious Judaism, after the Second World War. And de l'école au maquis, uh, la résistance juive en France, three themes. Uh, it's an old one, I, maybe, yes, some of you were as old as I am. Uh, and we'll remember uh, Gideon Hausner at the Eichmann trial asking uh, Jews why they didn't resist. Uh, or, um, or Hannah Arendt, uh, sounding the same note in Eichmann in Jerusalem. Uh, and her work is long alongside others shows that Jews did in fact resist, that you did in fact resist during the war. Youth groups played a critical role in this. Uh, and one of the major points of interest is it's not something that happens just during the war, but that this kind of resistance provides uh, the groundwork for the reconstruction of Jewish life in France after World War II. Joanna? Thank you so much. Thank you for your invitation. Um, first of all, I think we need to clarify what is implied by the words Jewish resistance, as it refers to different positions occupied by Jews who decided to fight back against persecution in occupied France. So what is Jewish resistance? There used to be two clear-cut opinions. For some historians, fighting for liberation of France as Jews was enough to characterize Jewish resistance. If you follow that definition, you can include in Jewish resistance, first of all, Jews who participated in the general resistance movement. And uh, I think, uh, for instance, uh, of René Cassin, who joined the General de Gaulle in London in November 1940. He is one of the authors of uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. You have also Jews who participated on, in uh, organizations like Combat or Front Tireur. Um, if you follow again this, def this definition I gave you, you can include also Jews who were members of communist resistant organizations. And among them, uh, there was the Jewish section of the, the underground immigrant workforce movement. Its full name is Front Tireur Partisan Main d'Oeuvre Immigré, FTP Moy. The Moy was created by French Communist Party in 1923 to gather foreign work workers according to their language. They created a Jewish branch of Yiddish language. FTP Moy, at the time of the war, was an armed force group against the Germans and the Vichy re regime, composed of foreigner Jews. It opened to French Jews in 1943 with the creation of the Union des Juifs pour la Résistance et l'Entraide. This movement has, has been thoroughly studied by the French historian Annette Viviorca. Some names of these Jews, resist, this Jewish resistance, may ring a bell. Henri Krasuki, a Jewish Polish communist who made sabotage, attacks on German trains, tra uh, on German trucks, forged the IDs, was deported in Auschwitz in June 1943. He became, after the war, a major French communist union leader. I think also of the Misak Manouchian members group. Uh, who were executed by the Germans in France, in Paris, in 1944. German and French created La Fiche Rouge, that you can see here, showing the picture of 10 members of this group, and they distributed it in Paris to discourage resistance. As I said, some of them are known, but others were immediately forgotten after the war like the 16-year-old 16, 16 Isidore David Grimbert, who joined the OS, Organisation Speciale, 
special organization, which was the secret military branch of the French Communist Party. I found track of him in French prison records. After he murdered the policeman in Paris, policeman who tried to arrest him as a Jew in 1942, he was sentenced to death penalty by a French military court and he was guillotined in Paris by, in, by the French. No one except his father kept his memory alive. But for some, someone like Lucien Lazare, historian and fighter in the Jewish Maquis, and for the majority of historians today, the most significant element enabling us to talk about Jewish resistance is the rescue mission of the Jews. When resistance in France aimed at victory against Nazis, Jewish resistance was struggling for Jews' survival. Following this definition, Jewish resistance can only apply to the Jews who were committed to rescue Jews. It could be individuals acting on their own impulse. And for instance, I'm very happy to show you the picture of Moussa Abadi and Odette Rosenstock, who made up the uh, network, the group Marcel. Together, they saved 530 Jewish children in the region of Nice, south of France. It could be also Jewish institutions saving Jews, and especially children. And I will quote only a few names, because there are lots of institutions, Jewish institutions to save children. Um, first of all, the Comité de la Rue Amlo, Amlo Street Committee with Henri Bulafco, head of this group. You have also Georges Garel group from the OSE, Oeuvre de Secours aux Enfants, Children Rescue Organization. With André Salomon, that you can see on the picture, they hid 1,600 Jewish children with the help of the Archbishop Saliège from Toulouse in the region near Lyon, Valence, Toulouse, and Limoges. Um, in total, OSE, this organization, saved, we, we think, about uh, 2,500 children. OSE was founded in Russia in 1912, uh, um, sorry, 1912 to protect Jewish population health. It was transferred in Berlin in 1923 under the patronage of Albert Einstein, and then it moved to Paris in 1933. You have also the Éclaireur Israelite de France, um, Jewish Boy Scouts, and La Sixième, its underground branch. They also saved children. They forged IDs, they conveyed Jews to Spain, to Switzerland. You can see here in the picture, it's a photo of the La Sixième, this clandestine branch, and they saved children in home, uh, especially in Chamonix. As you can see in the picture of the map, uh, here I put the map. My own research sheds a light on a specific form of Jewish resistance, the one combining Jewish armed rescue and Jewish education given to the young persecuted Jews. It has been implemented by a tight group of Jewish leaders who were members of different Jewish organizations. First of all, you have as I said, Les Éclaireurs Israélites de France, Jewish Boy Scout. The movement was founded uh, by um, Robert Gamzon, French Jew, who will, who will later uh, create the Jewish Maquis. You have also Le Mouvement de la Jeunesse Sioniste, Zionist Youth Movement, created by Simon Levit, who was a member of the Éclaireurs Israélites de France, he built, he was the one who built the Jewish library in Moissac, the home we spoke about a couple of minutes ago. And he saved hundreds of Jewish children by conveying them to Switzerland in 1944. You have also a leader from the OSE, Oeuvre de Secours aux Enfants. His name was Jacques Kohn. He worked along with the rabbi of Strasbourg, the, rab, the Deutsch, his name was Rabbi Deutsch. Uh, all the Jewish community from Strasbourg has to resettle in Limoges. 
and together they run in Limoges a boarding school and a very special school that was called Le Petit Seminaire Israelite de Limoges. You have also another youth movement uh, named Yeshurun, an orthodox non-Zionist group founded in Strasbourg in, 19, in the 20s after the German uh, neo-orthodox neo uh, uh, rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch and whose mem members, only boys, were also Boy Scouts. And another institution, l'Armée Juive, the Jewish Army, founded in Toulouse by Abraham and Eugenie Polonsky in 1942. It comes from a Jewish study group called Etude et Action, Study and Action, founded by the couple Knut, Polonsky, and Rotman in 1940 in Toulouse. The Jewish Army will become Organisation Juive de Combat, Jewish Fighters Organization, after the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, and will have its own maquis, very close to the Boy Scout maquis. So what do they have in common? Those Jewish leaders, both French and strangers, mainly uh, Eastern European, were educated people, open to the world, some of them religious, but most of the French Jewish resistance didn't know anything about Judaism or Jewish studies. Together, not only did they learn during the war, but they were committed in spreading Jewish studies and at the same time fighting in the resistance. resistance. They forged ideas, they hid Jews, especially children, but they fought in their own maquis. In early 1944, many of them joined the Maki, Jewish Maki created in the town region by Robert Gamzon, and also another Maki, the Maki from the Organisation Juive de, Com Juif de Combat, Jewish uh, Fighters Organization. As you can see here in the picture, uh, in the Maki you, can, you could find men and boy, boys and girls together. And I'm very happy tonight because uh, the woman who is on the picture you, we have uh, the pleasure tonight to have the um, great grandson of her uh, tonight in the room and his family. You have uh, the Marc Hagenau company run by Robert Gamzon. This is the Jewish Maquis, the Boy Scout Jewish Maquis. This uh, military uh, company was composed by 60 Jewish men. It liberated the cities of Castres and Mazamé. You can see here the, the military uh, uh, company. This is the, the liberation of the, the city of Castres. Some of fighters even <laughs> followed the French army directed by Commandant de Latre de Tassigny and fought in Germany until 1945. They explain what they did with, during World War II by using the expression biblical resistance. The fight is not only made for physical Jew survival, but for the survival of Jewish culture, studies, education. For instance, in Toulouse in 1941, the couple, Knut couple, they gathered around them the Jewish refugees in town in a Jewish study group called Etude et Action, Studies and Action. Together with Abraham Polonsky and Paul Rotman, they established secret meetings at the synagogue. Each Jew was supposed to plead his view on Jewish history and argue with another member. In November 1941, the argument who took place between Claude Viget, who is a great poet, and Ariane Knut, that you can see on the picture, was about Flavius Joseph Case. The group also met in secret to pray. This study group became quickly a resistance group called La Main Forte, the strong hand. It was aimed at helping foreign Jews targeted by the police. I'll give you another example. The Les Éclaireurs Israelites. After the dissolution of the Jewish children houses run by the Éclaireurs in the south of France, Les Éclaireurs opened a maquis in December 1943 in the town. The maquis was under the supervision of the French resistance. 
colonel du noyer de Segonzac, head of the former Uriage school, it was a school of Vichy, noticed that the Jewish military company didn't look like the others. He wrote in his diary, those Jews, all refugees, most of them foreigners, pray, study, and fight. One of the young leaders named Gilbert Bloch organized there what he called a hidden yeshiva, Bible courses, Hebrew le lessons, Shabbat office. All the boys joined to celebrate Shabbat. One of them wrote, some people, and he was uh, aiming at uh, Lucien Lazare and Gilbert Bloch, are trying to change the world by the Torah. Another fighter writes in his diary, Today, Bible lecture, conference on Jewish history, and cleaning for Shabbat before the office. Here you can see picture of the Eclaireur Israelite farms, where young Jews learned how to grow food and study Hebrew and Jewish text and celebrate Shabbat. And despite what you can see, you can see that you can imagine that we're in a peace time, but it's not, it's a war time. As my current research leads me to study Jews' everyday life in Paris during the occupation, I know that at the same time in Paris, some persecuted Jews could go on praying in synagogues, bury their loved ones according to the Jewish tradition, because Nazis didn't forbid Jewish religious activities while trying to kill all the Jews. This is a paradox, but the religious activities could go on. What characterized their Jewish resistance activity is that they plan Jewish, Jews' future in France. Three young Jewish leaders in the Eclaireur Maquis, Robert Gamzon, Leo Cohn, Leo Cohn, you, Leo Cohn, you may have seen him, uh, it was the, on the first uh, photo of my slide, the first one, the, the man who was uh, giving a flower to his daughter. He was a German immigrant uh, in Paris. So Robert Gamzon, Leo Cohn, and Gilbert Bloch imagined in 1944 the future training school for the new generation of Jewish leaders in France. The Orsay School will actually open near Paris in 1946. Its real name is École Gilbert Bloch, the, in, in homage as a tribute to the leader who got killed by the Nazi in August 1944. It was a bet on a future for, for Jews in France. A school made to give young J Jewish men and women from France and North Africa Jewish tradition and at the same time, on the same level, French culture excellency. Oh, I forgot to show you those pictures from the Eclaireur Israeli during the war. So this is the picture I meant to see, to show you. Orsay, First promotion. New kind, it was a new kind of religious Jewish life that was promoted in France. A mix of Jewish studies, Shabbat, and Jewish festivities offices, but attending the offices was never mandatory. Boys and girls were, were together just as in the Maquis. And I have another picture where you can see offices. Like you have <coughs> at the uh, on your right, you have Robert Gamzon, and uh, at the left, you have uh, someone who is uh, very known in France, Léon Ashkenazi, uh, his uh, nickname was Manitou. This school has completely ch changed the shape of French Judaism. Before, before World War II and Orsay, French Jewish education was mostly designed to turn Jews into French citizens. The main idea was to reshape Jewish identity in order to make it consistent with French political culture, based on the division between private and public spaces, and public space being neutral. Judaism, as well as other religions, was only meant to be expressed in private space. With Jews' persecution by the French government, and also because anti-Jews legislation made the meeting of French Jews with Jews from Central and Eastern Europe possible, the whole French Jewish identity transformed. In what way? Starting from this point, 
the strong connection between France and Jews started to weaken. And some Jews in France considered themselves as French and as Jews, but not French Jews anymore. The content of Jewish studies changed in France. Jews started to study Hebrew, Jewish history, Bible, Talmud, but also Midrach. And Midrach was not taught in France before the war. This change was due to the influence of some Eastern European Jewish intellectuals, refugees in Paris during French occupation. And here you can see the man with the glasses. His name is Jacob Gordin. He was born in Latvia, student in St. Petersburg and then Berlin, close to Hermann Cohen's group. He studied Kabbalah with Ukrainian Jews in Yalta in 1917. He was a refugee in Paris in 1931, but couldn't find a position at French University. He met Emmanuel Levinas at the Alliance Israelite Universelle, where Gordon was head of the library. After 1940, he became an accounting for the Eclaireur Israelite children home in the south of France, Beaulieu. There, he was discovered as a Jewish study master by Georges Levit, the brother of Simon Levit. You saw the picture, the founder of the Zionist youth movement. Back to Paris in late 1944, he became in 1946 the teacher of Jewish master at Orsay School, but he died in 1947. The French Judaism today is Gordon heritage through thinkers and rabbis like Léon Ashkenazi, Manitou, but also the philosopher Emmanuel Levinas. What did Gordin bring to French Judaism? I, quote, I will quote what his uh, disciples uh, say about him. Consider our books as great books. Reverse the scale of values and put Jew Jewish tradition first as a reference. Universal thinking must be evaluated with the criteria of Jewish conscience. With that method, they develop, develop a new way to study Jewish tradition, mixing philosophy and mysticism. Between 1945 and 1967, this group of Jewish fighters became leaders of the Jewish communities in France. They became teachers. They opened and ran Jewish schools and studies groups. They trained new generation of French Jews according to Gordon's legacy. But other Jewish fighters didn't find in France after 1945 the, the possibility to live and raise their family as Orthodox Jews. I give you the example of Marc Breuer, a German Jew who arrived in France in 1933. He was the great grandson of Rabbi Hirsch, the founder of the Yeshurun. Um, before the war, he was a teacher of Talmud in Paris. Then he took care of a religious maquis for the Eclaireur. Um, then he took part of the resistance in Vercors. But after the war, he couldn't find a position in a Jewish school after. So he moved, he had to leave France, and he moved with his family to New York City, where he became a salesman and wrote comments on the Torah, very famous. He died in New York City in 2002. To conclude, I would like to quote Aaron Appelfeld, the Israeli uh, Nobel Prize author, who described perfectly one consequence of Jews' persecution during World War II in his book, Beyond Despair. It was published in 2005. The Holocaust did not catch the Jew with his ancient face at its most powerful, but at a moment of weakness when he was trying to find his way. Considerable portions of the Jewish people had already passed beyond the bounds of their Jewishness. The woods and the bunkers not only provided shelter against the enemy, but also served as a kind of retreat, allowing one to get to the source of all that suffering. In the wood and the bunkers, the vehement discussion would last until dawn. The Jew faced not only the Nazis, but also in his own Jewishness, which was haunting him. Thank you.